When they talk about glee in a glee club, I think of it differently. I think many people interpret that as meaning some jovial conviviality, laughing. But when I think of it in, in our case, I think of it as a deeper kind of satisfaction that comes from excellence. China was the one dream in my life. And uh, when they called me and asked me if I was interested in coming with them, I jumped. It took me about two minutes to decide that I wanted to get to China. Late in the evening of December 28th, the Cornell University Glee Club departs Ithaca, New York to begin a 50-hour odyssey to the Far East. As it turned out, I think we had quite, a, quite an adventure and getting from Ithaca to our first stop in Singapore. Uh, some had rather direct routing and others, I think, visited some exotic islands in the South Pacific en route. But fortunately, everyone arrived safe and sound at the appointed hour in Singapore. The Cornell tour arrives on the last day of 1988. An ultra-modern Singapore condominium is the setting for a New Year's Eve celebration exactly one degree north of the equator, where the travelers are the guests of graduate Ed Harris and his wife Apilai. A full hundred Cornelians, student and alumni singers, wives and a few guests, celebrate their alma mater and the beginning of a new year half a world away from home. The songs, not unexpectedly, are traditional, but they take by surprise another alumnus living in the same complex. It was just by coincidence tonight I was out uh, walking around uh, before going out for the evening and I heard the Cornell songs and I said, uh, that sounds very familiar. So I uh, strolled over to the pool and I said, what's going on? And I see this party and I walked over and I said, uh, you know, is this uh, Cornell group? And they said, yes, the Cornell Glee Club is here for a concert. And I said, uh, that is quite a coincidence. So here I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm a party crasher tonight <laughs> is what I am. So, uh, Singapore is a great place to live. We've enjoyed it very much. And it's great to see uh, a group from Cornell here. It really is. A tour of the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz in Singapore Harbor provides not only an education, but also a reminder that harmony is a delicate balance, fleeting at best. A mere 20 years ago, a group of young men stopping at Singapore on their way north would not have been civilians, and their purpose not peaceful. And they're really safe. When the Navy first started using uh, catapults, they were uh, hydraulically operated. And those, uh, they had a little problem. At one point in the early 70s, it was estimated that the building of a new living space in Singapore was completed every four minutes. But while progress has reshaped the city's skyline, it has altered neither the island's natural beauty nor its position as the world's busiest port.
amidst the high rises stands St. Andrew's Cathedral on the site selected for it by Thomas Raffles in 1823. Here the group presents his first concert. The next evening in Victoria Hall, the Glee Club performs its full repertoire, showcasing a diversity as impressive as that of Singapore itself.
Beijing, two days later, a city which in a few months will echo the laments of Belloc's poem. A mere two inches of snow, the most in three years, has virtually brought the region to a standstill. Having journeyed from the southernmost to the northernmost point on their tour, the travelers brave the cold and ice to visit the Forbidden City, home of the Chinese emperors for several centuries, and recently brought to the attention of the world by the film The Last Emperor. The argument at the gate follows a refusal to allow broadcast television cameras inside and centers on the capricious manner in which regulations seem to change weekly. In retrospect, it is not hard to see the signs of stress beneath the surface. The upshot is that the forbidden city remains forbidden. Until we abandon our big cameras in favor of camcorders, we are not permitted to go in any more than Emperor Pu Yi, the subject of Bertolucci's film, was permitted to go out.
Peking duck, perhaps the city's most famous delicacy, is the centerpiece of a banquet given in the performer's honor at the Windows on the World restaurant. The opportunity to sample authentic Chinese cuisine is one of the most popular benefits of the tour. One unusual recipe for chicken calls for baking it in clay, and the first step in serving it becomes a ritual privilege. And on the subject of original chicken recipes, Beijing is also the home of the world's largest and arguably busiest Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken Restaurant, located just off Tiananmen Square. I guess just walking through that square, it's a pretty large square, alone early in the morning, it, it's, it looks very imposing. And just the immediate neighborhood was starting to wake up, people bicycling all around. And I've studied a little bit of Chinese history. I know that there's a lot in uh, Chinese history which has gone on in that square. And just as I was walking around, I, was, I guess I'm glad I was alone so I couldn't share my silly thoughts with anybody. Within six months, history would once again leave its mark on Tiananmen Square. But amid the peaceful January snow, there is little reason to suspect that it might be a long time before another group of singers can visit Beijing, or that the modern Western hotels, devoid of power and plumbing, will become places of refuge from flying bullets. For the Cornell group, it is all a holiday. About three people picked up little snowballs, just gave them a half-hearted toss, and then all of a sudden this gigantic barrage of missiles came flying through the air. It was a fight from then on, purely friendly though. I think it was a good international relations exercise. I personally will never get tired of the Cornell songs. I think the group enjoys singing them very much, too. And when you bring those out, either at a reception or in a performance, it's always the people from Cornell that really they look forward to those in the performances. The performance at the Beijing Concert Hall brings out Beijing's musical community in force. 
a major composer, actress and conductor are among those present at what in America would be called a stellar reception. Given Cornell's long-standing Chinese connection, it is not surprising to see a prominent alumnus among the dignitaries, in this case, the former Minister of Agriculture. Cousins all over the world are one family. Therefore, you are not in a foreign country. You are now in your Chinese family. <laughs> Probably the evening's most memorable event is the appearance of Leslie Severinghouse, himself an ex-Glee Club member, who traveled and taught in China during the 1920s and visited the country many times during the tumultuous decades that followed. He is introduced to the audience by 1986 alumnus Susan Pallini, a Beijing resident who served as liaison for the club throughout its stay in China. But I can speak English also. After 62 years, Sasha Shandong Shangren, Sasha Shangren. I wish she were here with me. She spoke beautiful Chinese. I can assure you that I am enjoying what these Qing Nianren are singing <laughs> as much as you are. I would love to see from this country, from Beijing, a group like this come to America and sing. Sing with these people. This is the way the world can be changed. Singing from one group of people to another. Rocky Ball! Push your cruise, Mississippi, push your shot, on the Lulu, push your say, Chichi Kaka. The Copa Catapa, the Lichy Chicana, the Solid in Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Rocky Ball! Push your cruise, Mississippi, push your shot, on the Lulu, push your say, Chichi Kaka.
Once we began the rehearsal for the Mozart at the conservatory in Shanghai, the players in the orchestra, who were all conservatory students, um, somehow um, devoted themselves. They really became enthusiastic. And one sensed this. I had the feeling that if we asked them to rehearse for five hours, they would have enthusiastically done so. The instruments were very poor quality, and it, your heart went out to these people. They're trying to be artists, and uh, they have very little to work with, and they did a bang-up job in that concert. Mozart's Freemasons Cantata, the centerpiece of the concert at the Shanghai Conservatory, is rarely performed even in the West. In Shanghai, orchestra and audience alike are hearing it for the first time. It is one of Mozart's last compositions. Its text, printed in Chinese in the program, speaks eloquently of the joy and strength that come from brotherhood and unity. Der Gedanke, dass nun die Menschheit wieder einen Platz unter Menschen gewann, süßt die Erinnerung an die Städte, wo jede Bruders Herz ihm, was er war und was er ist. Und was er werden kann, so ganz bestimmt, wo Beispiel ihn belegt, wo echte Bruder Liebe seine pflegt, und wo alle Tugenden Heiligste, Erste, alle Tugenden Könige, Wohltätigkeit in stillem Glanze thront. One couldn't help be aware of the fact that there was a 20-year hiatus in the training of musicians and artists, and this can't be overcome quickly. I think they're making great progress now in the, in the institutions, but uh, it took a heavy toll 
especially in those arts that involve uh, disciplined training over a period of time, string players, for example, uh, once that tradition is uh, in a moratorium, it's quite difficult to revive. During the final chorus, something extraordinary happens. A reception the next evening at the U.S. Consulate provides a showcase for the subgroup known as the Hangovers, whose 40s-style harmonies seem oddly suited to the environment.
back in China. Uh, everything's a 40 watt, 20 watt bulb, and it's dark. It was so refreshing to see <laughs> the neon signs <laughs> and all the shopping. Hong Kong is the last stop on the tour. Here, as in Singapore, the city shape has changed radically in the last 15 years. The Glee Club will perform in one of the concert halls of the Academy of Performing Art, built in the middle of the old red light district. To the distinguished musician, Michael Rippon, who's going to do Ego Sumabas. <laughs> whoever was going to do this. I'm sorry to uh, take away your moment of glory. <laughs> well, when, when I used to go around singing, I used to go to Wales in Britain, you know, and the Welsh, they love singing, and they think they are the greatest singers in the world, which many of them are. And so they, you'd go along and they'd sort of greet you and they, they speak like this, you know, they'd say, hello, Mr. Ripon, it's lovely to have you to come to sing to us. And they'd say, because you're going to be singing such and such, aren't you? Oh, a nasty high note in that, you know. <laughs> they say, they say thank, thank you very much. And then they say, but don't worry, don't worry. We've got Di in the choir, sings it beautiful, you know. <laughs> and you sort of think, yeah, thanks for the confidence. So, I believe that all of you have copies of the text of the next piece, excerpt from Carmina Burana by Carl Orff. This text is a product of the Galliard monks of Bavaria, or it's purported to be. These Galliard monks were either defrocked priests or young men who began their studies for the priesthood and then had a change of mind for various reasons. One of the reasons was for worldly pleasure. Now the portion of Carmina Burana that we sing this evening is really quite ribald in nature, drinking songs. And for this occasion in Hong Kong, which is such a delight for those of us from Cornell University, we are so pleased that the baritone solo, the person playing and singing the part of the inebriated abbot, is Hong Kong's own Michael Rippon. Delighted to introduce Michael, and we will proceed with Carl Orr. Ha 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 ha! 
In what may be the world's capital city for worldly pleasures, anything and everything is for sale. Hong Kong's whole personality reflects its preoccupation with commerce. A citywide choral festival has been built around the Glee Club's appearance. As a finale, all 400 singers will perform together. All the choirs should mix, so we'll have sopranos, tenors, altos, basses, all mixed up. I think it would be very nice if you could make sure you're not standing next to somebody who you know, standing next to somebody you do not know. That, I think, would be rather fun. Right. Forty orchestra. Got it. Ah. No, 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 there's a long, long pause. 
spacious. Once again, once again, take your time. Right. Thank you. And. finale to this what for us is a marvelous occasion. We enjoy very much giving concerts at various places around the world. One of our special privileges comes when we make music with others from around the world. And tonight we have the privilege of performing with the Academy Orchestra and with these five marvelous choirs. And those of us from Ithaca, New York are delighted to join in this music making, which is really, after all, quite an international language. It seems to me that when you have on the same stage uh, the more than 70 years between a 17-year-old and a 90-year-old, and you have uh, half the world that you have covered from your home base to the place you're performing. You have this combination of languages, English, Chinese. You have different musical traditions, different social traditions, different uh, diets, uh, habits, mores. But through all of it, there is uh, there is a commonness, there's a common bond. And I think somehow uh, music tends to bring out the beauty in this bond.
most people on the trip learn to say uh, three phrases in Chinese. Uh, one is ni hao, which means hi, how are you, to xie xie, which means thank you. And the third is wei pi jiu, which means I want a beer. And when uh, we were getting on the plane, we were supposed to surrender our boarding passes, and we did. I think I was one of the last people who, came, who, who did it, but I noticed that everybody ahead of me would give their boarding pass and say xie xie in uh, various intonations. And then uh, my turn came, I gave my boarding pass, I said, xie xie. And uh, um, the woman who took my uh, boarding pass turned around to her partner with the most bewildered look on her face and said, God, they all speak Chinese. <laughs>